what happens when you don't pay attention. The screen goes blank. Well, good morning. Good morning. Lots going on this week. Lots of injuries and illnesses and this morning an accident, unfortunately. <laughs> so we're going to maybe slow things down a little bit here as we wait for uh, a few folks to show up after that. So for you that are watching online, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, the announcements and everything will be posted up in the chat there, along with the link to the worship music that Pastor Mark has curated for this morning. Very good list, so you'll want to watch that once the stream is done. So uh, This Wednesday, um, but you can't guess what we're doing. Got the engagement project. It's hard to believe we are this far in. So we started at zero, and now we're coming up on three. So we're actually on four. So this is not new math. We're not trying to mess anybody up. Not gonna get in trouble for doing the math wrong. But because it started at zero, we're actually in our fourth week, which is hard to believe because one more week and we'll be halfway through this, this series. And uh, it is an incredible series, and I got a feeling that uh, God just doesn't, or not God, God wants you to hear this message, but Satan does not want to hear you, have you hear a message on redemption and the heart of God and what that looks like. So uh, we just need to all be in, in prayer as we listen to this, and we pray that this, uh, as well as the rest of the series, blows up on social media and, and on YouTube where it could be watched and enjoyed there. Uh, coming up in a couple of weeks. So we got a little bit of a break here. We got Memorial Day in between. So but, uh, our next men's breakfast is gonna be June 1st. Rumor has it there might be a biscuits and gravy pizza. <laughs> of course, you know rumors, it's kind of like gossip. You never know for sure if it's real or not. So we'll find out that day, but there'll be plenty of good food. There always is. Plenty of good fellowship and a great time of devotion time uh, that we'll have as well. Then following uh, two weeks later after that, and we're taking two weeks skips here, uh, we'll be coming up on the Cedar Rapids Freedom Festival flag retirement ceremony and the honoring of our fallen veterans. And this is a time where uh, Mark and I have had this uh, opportunity as a part of Grace Street Church for several years now to read the names of our fallen soldiers from Iowa uh, those that have died after having served in the military over this past 12 month period. And every year there's always someone on that list that we know. And that makes it a little more difficult to get past that name, uh, especially when you're out in the heat and the smoke from the fire and then you can't see because you got a little tear coming down. Uh, it is a great time to honor those from our military and thank them for their service and their sacrifice as the flags are retired. So you see that big old bonfire right in the middle there? Um, all of the flags that have been turned in are then folded. And then there is a specific ceremony that takes place to honorably retire those by placing them in the fire and burning them. And then uh, it begins with the singing of the national anthem and of course we'll conclude with a moment of silence and the playing of tabs. If you want to know more about that, you can go out to our website. Um, if you click on In the Know, go to In the Community, you can see that uh, link there. There's actually a video there from Facebook from a couple years ago when Mark and I had done that, so you can see what that looks like. Then we're going to take a big break. We'll have our men's breakfast, of, of course, in July, but our next racing, uh, due to some scheduling conflicts, will not be until July 13th, so no June races. So you'll want to join us on the 13th of July. And then at some point, I believe it's the second Wednesday because the first Wednesday interferes with the, uh, the July 4th festivities. Um, we'll be starting a 10 week uh, series on Wednesday nights and certainly Sundays with the sermons on the Bible, the Epic Ministry. So the movie that y'all watched last night the Son of God, this is what the Son of God movie was taken from. It's kind of, Son of God was a summary of this 10 week uh, mini series. So we're gonna take it out and stretch it out a little bit and do that. And then 
Uh, finally, of course, uh, today's worship will be listed off in the announcements. <coughs> and our weary travelers have made it. Yes. So <laughs> we're going to pause. No station identification. That's <laughs> Wade's thing during work track. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Maybe we can say our Father together while we wait. <laughs> that we can do. Let's pray. Our Father is in heaven. <laughs> Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. has happened this morning and over the past week we were talking about this just a little bit ago that we all need that time with God today Father God we just thank you and amidst all the turmoil and the things that are going on in the world and in our personal lives all the ways that the evil one has tried to slow us down or prevent us from spending time with you Father you're in control Regardless of the outcome here, you're in control. And regardless of how it feels right now, you're in control. Because of your redemptive love, that we have hope. We thank you for that hope, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our passage this morning for our call to worship comes from Acts chapter 2, 1 and 4 says this, On the day of Pentecost, all of the Lord's followers were together in one place. Suddenly there was a noise from heaven like the sound of a mighty wind. It filled the house where they were meeting. Then they saw what looked like fiery tongues moving in all directions. And a tongue came and settled on each person there. The Holy Spirit took control of everyone, and they began speaking. Whatever languages the Spirit let them speak. This is something that they had been praying about, praying for. And on the day of Pentecost, they would see fruit. Think about the responses that you have seen from God when you pray together with other believers. And the things that happen and the mighty works that God does in our lives. Well, on this day, this day of Pentecost, it marks the time of the wheat harvest. And it commemorates the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. It was the second of the annual harvest festivals, which came 50 days after Passover. God doesn't do anything randomly. He had this all planned out. Many of the Jews would travel to Jerusalem for Pentecost, or they'll stay there after Passover to await it. Jesus, in this passage is referenced because he talked about the Holy Spirit's work as the wind in John 3 8. When we look at verse 4, the tongues in which the apostles were miraculously enabled to speak were the various native languages. Could you imagine if Mark and I got up here and we started preaching a message and both of us are preaching the same message but we're preaching it in a language that neither of us knew to people that could understand it. Wow. That it just boggles my mind. It blows me away. These were visitors to Jerusalem. And these languages, it wasn't some unintelligible gibberish. Like Klingon. 
that nobody's going to understand except a true trekkie, right? Um, th this is something that was not made up. These were actual languages that they were reaching the people with. And as the scripture goes on to say, over 3,000 would come to know God that day. This was a fulfillment of Jesus' promise that they would receive power through the Holy Spirit and be his witnesses to the world. What did he say at the end of his time with the disciples? Go. The new covenant age is begin it was beginning and it's not going to end until Jesus returns. And I know y'all, we keep looking, see him riding in on a cloud, but when he comes back, it will be incredible. Father God, we just thank you for this message that you've given to Mark this morning, this fourth tour in the Engagement Project series that we're doing, Redemption, talking about your heart, Father. The love that, as I know Mark's going to talk about, that can't be expressed in the English version of the word love, but has to be looked at from the ancient Hebrew and from the language then where we can see so many different ways that love is expressed and love is defined. Father, thank you for this love that you've given us. Thank you for your mercy and your forgiveness. Thank you for the hope so that we can be redeemed in your eyes. So when eternity, our turn comes to join you in eternity, you will welcome us home. Not saying, go away, I do not know you, but walking me us into your arms. And damn it. In Jesus' name. Good morgen, wie geht's? Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Diese sind die uh, Tage, Bonjour. das Gott hat gemacht. Es ist ziemlich ungewöhnlich. Dick, it's Pentecost. Sunday, today. If you know German, you probably know what I said there. If you don't know German, you probably don't know what I said there. <laughs> this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad mm -hmm. in it. And it is a wonderful day today. Although all kinds of stuff is going on, and this whole last week has just been wow, uh, it's still a great day. God got us out of bed this morning, woke us up from our slumber, and brought us here to be together in his presence here today. And we just praise you and thank you for that. Um, so, as we journey through our epics that we've had. If we remember the epics we had, we started out with the creation and then we went to the fall and now we're here in this, which is the royal task. And this is, this, this is the epic that we are actually living in right now, this time frame in the whole timeline uh, that we have to look forward to. So tour four, uh, which is where we're at now, and we start at Tour Zero, which was kind of the introduction and welcome to the bus, sign your waivers, we're going for this tour. So, uh, Tour Four focuses on the questions, why did Jesus leave and what did he do for us? So the movie last night, if you, if you watched the movie last night, you pretty much know what he did for us. There was no, no gray area there whatsoever. But this is the epic where we live. This epic is each one of the epics that we have has been characterized by a special event, a, an extraordinary event, if you will. Um, so we know that the creation was an extraordinary event. Lots happening in the creation. And then the fall. Well, we know that there was an extraordinary event in the fall as well. And so in this topic in here, um, we're going to kind of take a look at the eternal ramifications of the epic that we live in. And then this epic is the royal task. And uh, this is characterized by two extraordinary events, not just one, but two of them this time around. Jesus physically left the earth 
he left us after coming in and then he returned and is dwelling with us by the power of the Holy Spirit and we couldn't have timed this more perfect being Pentecost Sunday today because that's what Pentecost is all about 50 days passed when we had Jesus and his resurrection Pentecost means 50 so we have the 50 days following we know that 40 days after he had the resurrection he ascended into heaven and so 10 days later we have Pentecost and uh, as this is Pentecost Sunday it's a perfect time to talk then about the Holy Spirit being sent by God to dwell in and among his people that means that we have the Spirit of God sent to us from God when we accept Christ into our hearts when we become believers and accept by faith God sends the Holy Spirit to dwell within us and those who love and obey God then have the Holy Spirit dwelling or indwelling with us and you probably heard me talk about that a couple of weeks ago one night he said that he will be and abide with us forever and that's what that means is that he will abide in us and we in him and God will abide in us and we in him as our faith grows and as our relationship with God grows then we understand that power of the Holy Spirit and what it's doing in our lives so it had been 50 days since Easter Sunday and Christ being raised from the dead and the account in Acts 2 then that we had as our opening today for our call to worship uh, it reports that after Jesus ascended into heaven then Jesus followers were gathered together for the Feast of the Harvest and that is where they all came together in for that feast uh, it's one of the seven holy feasts in the Jewish uh, year that we have and even back then it was known as Pentecost so uh, it has kind of a dual meaning and the Holy Spirit filled the whole house where they were sitting if you can imagine that wouldn't that be a great thing to do we find that in Acts 2 2 and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them so we see this enabling power of the Spirit starting to manifest itself in believers at that point in time and it was kind of a strange thing and so when this happened if, if you can imagine everyone is is gathered together and they're all speaking in their native language and their native tongues and everything in there uh, and so in these days when it was when it was brought together and this happened then well that obviously drew a large crowd and so then Peter, being enabled by the Holy Spirit, if we remember what, what happened with Peter earlier on, well, he denied Christ three different times. Mm -hmm. And he questioned his whole belief system, but he was now filled and enabled with the Holy Spirit. And he stood up and began to speak to them about repentance and the gospel of Christ. And we find that in Acts 2.14. And by the end of that day then, now, you guys only have to listen to me for about 45 minutes or so but if you can imagine Peter was up speaking to them for from what I took from my study guides and everything four hours so he was up there giving a four-hour sermon are you ready can we try and break that record today not so much but. Uh, you're laughing at me okay <laughs> but by the end of that day the Holy Spirit then came to that crowd of people that were gathered together and the church grew by over 3,000 people that day now it doesn't mean that all of the people gathered there were filled with the Spirit only those who came to believe they ex estimated the crowd to be somewhere between uh, five to eight thousand people were gathered to hear so I imagine the people in the way, way back really couldn't hear all that well. However, <laughs> the neat thing about that is, is once these people were filled with the Spirit, then they could go out and as we remember from Wednesdays uh, with the seed, you plant the one seed and then you get the tree and then you get two trees and then you get four trees. and then So we have that sequence going in there of the growth of the early church. So 
What happened next was even more spectacular in the lives of the apostles uh, gathered there. And, and uh, so I was reading um, from Bible scholar uh, John Gill, and he wrote this. Through this baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire, the apostles came, became more knowing. And this is what we were talking about when we gathered together in study, is we grow in our knowledge, and then as we grow, then we are sent out to go and do. So he says that the apostles became more knowing and had a greater understanding of the mysteries of the gospel. As our relationship with God grows, as our understanding grows, as we study more, then God reveals more of his word to us. How many times have we read the same passage in the Bible and then all of a sudden, boom, you know, the light goes out above your head and you go, oh, now I understand what this means. Or you're in a study group and you're saying, oh, well, I've never heard this before, and now it finally makes a lot more sense to you. So this is what it means to be able to grow in the spirit and grow in your understanding of what is written in the gospel. And then they were more qualified then to go out and preach it to all of the nations, all of the nations and languages. Think about that one there, languages at the same time. So it was more than a mere manifestation of the Holy Spirit for them. It was a transformation of the apostles at that time. So they were transformed into being messengers of God at that point in time. The Holy Spirit transformed them. And I like to think of it as, a, as kind of a graduation gift that Jesus had blessed them with. So they've been you know, walking with him and talking with him and learning with him this whole time as he was their rabbi. And I'm going to have to sit down. I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, he was their rabbi. And so... Uh, they were in the learning process this whole time. And now he told them to wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit came upon them. And in doing so, the Holy Spirit empowered them, emboldened them, and gave them what they needed to be able to go out and do what Jesus had done. And if we remember uh, Matthew 28 tells us in there to go into all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I have given you the power to do healings and, and remove demons and everything in his name. And so this empowerment that came upon them as the Holy Spirit came in, this enabling power then for the apostles gave them the ability, they were transformed then from just being you know regular students, this graduation gift now, they, they can go out and do everything that they were brought in to do. He called them to do. So he called them into service and now he enabled and empowered them to go and do that service. And that's really what this is all about. Um, so he empowered them to go forth and preach the good news. And preaching uh, is more than just getting up and reading a bunch of words on a page or anything. But preaching means that you're going to you're going to proclaim that good news Boldly and with authority. Boldly and with authority. Because by the power of the Holy Spirit, it enables you. And trust me, when you're up here and you're giving a message and you know what you have written on the page here, and, and I mess the people up in the back all the time because <laughs> as I'm giving the message, you know, I'm also giving thing, other things that God says, hey, you may have let this out, but I want these people, someone in this room needs to hear this. And that message comes popping into my head, pops into Terry's head, as we're giving the message. And that is the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And so it, it's kind of a, a neat thing because you're validated at that point in time by God saying, preach this message boldly and with authority for me. So when a pastor is empowered with the Holy Spirit, they preach with authority. And that is because, only because, of the spirit of holiness is speaking through them. And if you notice, a couple of years ago I started, uh, I talked about this in a message about the, the spirit of holiness. Everybody calls it the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. But it is the spirit of holiness. It is a right relationship that you're establishing with God. And then that enables you then to go and speak with authority on behalf of God. Not on behalf of me, but on behalf of God. 
So the New Testament event that is so significant here of Pentecost is because it fulfills the Old Testament prophecy. The blessing of the Holy Spirit was foretold by the prophet Joel all the way back in Joel 2, 28 and 29. And afterwards I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy and your old men will dream dreams and young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Now, if we remember, only the heads of the household, only the males were able to go to synagogue and go through the studies in the old Jewish tradition. But here, it's being prophesied 450 years before it actually happened, before Pentecost came and God sent the Holy Spirit. He says, I will pour out my spirit on all people, not just the Jews, but the Gentiles alike. So this is including now all of God's people together. The Jews were God's chosen people to start with, but what did they do? They kind of rejected God the whole time. So what did he have to do? He had to send judges and all the rest of these things. We know all that Old Testament. All the things that God did to try and bring the people back into a right relationship with him. And if you notice, only certain people were anointed back in those days with the Holy Spirit to be God's representatives. But now God brought his only son to come in and make that right relationship back with all of his creation. All of his creation. And so... Uh, when the prophet Joel said this, then he was foretelling this Pentecost was the moment in history after Christ had ascended then that fulfilled what he told his followers would happen 450 years before. God's plan, you know, that's, that's the problem with us is, is, is we think of God in the same finite platform or finite uh, era that we're in, and, and he's not finite, he's infinite omnipresent uh, and so we got to quit putting God in that little box that we fit into because that's kind of the only way we can envision him we need to think bigger because God is much much bigger than anything we can think about so he had promised according to the gospel narratives and in earthly ministry when Jesus was here that he would in fact be leaving but he would send uh, and the word he used is the comforter and I love that I will send the comforter, the advocate that will then be the Holy Spirit which will come upon you and enable you and embolden you. And so he is equipping us then to go out and fulfill the great commission that he had in Matthew 28. And it was at that moment of Pentecost when the Spirit came and then empowered those early believers. In the, and at that moment, specifically the apostles then, we're giving these extra abilities. He's, he sent that empowerment down to the apostles at that time. Also, this is when Peter, who out of fear, who, as I said, had denied even knowing Jesus three times, and we saw that in the movie last night, when he, after being empowered by the Holy Spirit, and because of, and I want you to hang on to this term today, because we're going to kind of push this one a little bit, because of agape love, grace and mercy. Those are the things that God was sending to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Then Peter is chosen to be the one who stands up in front of this crowd. Now remember, he denied him just to a handful of people before. So now here's this crowd of five to 8,000 gathered together. He's emboldened and empowered to stand up and preach the good news with power and authority to this crowd of people. Probably numbering in, like say, between five to 8,000 to proclaim the gospel there in the midst of a Hebrew celebration. So they were gathered for the, for the, uh, the feast. And in the midst of this, this celebration that the Jews had was to remind the people, that's what the feasts are all about, was each one had a theme that would remind the people of different things. So it was to remind them of all of the things that God had provided for them in their lives. And so Peter stands up in the middle of this celebration and starts preaching the good news. And he he's, is up there and he's emboldened. 
And God sends the Spirit down upon him, and that's when Peter sends up and he goes, well, let me tell you about my Messiah. Can you imagine that? And he is the eternal protection for all humanity. Let me tell you who he is. But let me tell you about my Jesus. Sound like a song you might know? Yeah, we're going to hear that today. I couldn't help myself. We've got to hear that song today. And so Pentecost becomes this historical marker that at this point in time. A point in time where people will then say, this is the moment when the church was actually born. So they had the small groups before, but now they have large gatherings gathered together, emboldened and empowered by the Holy Spirit to go forth and preach the good news with power and authority. So a lot of pastors were created that way, if you want to look at it that way. Uh, so and they're all out there... They get to go out and sing, let me tell you about my Jesus as well. So about 3,000 came to faith that day. And see, that's what engagement is all about. We're going through the engagement process in here right now. So engagement is when thousands of people then come to faith, that is where we're at we're with engagement. And it goes from this little tiny sect of believers that they had, these small groups of believers, who followed this Jewish rabbi from Nazareth, as we heard in the film last night, and who died and rose again, a story that could never be told by anyone else because it never happened to anyone else, before or after. And so when we think about that, we think about, you know, this is a story which has to be told. And so we have something to go out and preach about. We have good news of salvation through Christ that can be preached out to all people. So we can go outside the Jewish community and preach it to all people. So then suddenly the church breaks forth out into the culture of the day in there and historically then that is when the church is born. And suddenly it's this unstoppable force that nobody can really deny any longer. You know, everybody in that Jewish community, you had all the Pharisees and, and I hate to keep saying that about the movie, but man, that was a good movie last night. Because mm -hmm. it made all these points. And I wrote this a week before mm -hmm. we watched the movie. Uh, so suddenly we have this unstoppable force out there that nobody can deny anymore. The, the Pharisees can't say, well, you know, this isn't it. You saw them kind of running like rats scattering from, you know, mm -hmm. when the uh, temple was shaking and, this, and the curtain was torn in two. They knew that, whoops, guess what? We just went against God. But still, they were in denial. Not the river. They were in denial. So, oh, you got that one. Cool. Cool. You were listening. All right. So Pentecost has taken on a new significance for us then as well. Uh, because at one point in time, it's just this historical marker memory that's out there. But now it's the living reality of the moment that it happened. The Spirit of God seemingly burst forth and changed the future for all that believe. I mean, that's like a wow moment. So I, when I told you, each one of these epics has got something extraordinary that happens. This is it. This is extraordinary. Think about that. The Spirit of God actually coming down and inhabiting people. Indwelling is what the word says. That's the term that it used. Indwelling. So, I mean, wow, right? This is, this is not something that happens every day of the week. So, this is something incredible. So, this kind of answers, why did Jesus leave and what did he ask us to do? Well, he had to leave in order that we, the believers, would step up and step out to do the work that needs to be done. Jesus, as one person, could only affect so many people within his lifetime. But if we, he leaves and he empowers thousands at a time, think back to that seed illustration from last, uh, last Wednesday night. So instead of one seed being planted and many, many trees coming from it, we're planting 3,000 seeds in one shot. And then look at the exponential growth that happens. So this is an extraordinary event, extraordinary event. So that is why Jesus was, so we answered the question, why did Jesus have to leave? Because 
that emboldened then us as believers to go up, step out, step out to do the work that needed to be done. But he also needed to leave so that his word would be fulfilled, sending the spirit of holiness to dwell within his believers. So he told us that he was going to send that advocate, the comforter, to come and dwell within us. And then that ties in perfectly with our tour four. Love this, how this goes together? God, you're great. That's all there is to it. So the true nature of God, what we've been waiting for since tour zero, the true nature of God, or what uh, Del Tackett calls the crown jewel of God, in this epic, in this whole study then, is that crown jewel is love. Not just any kind of love, but agape love. Now people in today's society have dumbed down what true love really means. I love that pair of shoes. You know, I love this food over here. So they've really dumbed down that term of love into being something that just is not as special as what it is. You'd practically call anything love. You got the temptation tray over there filled, <laughs> filled with happy birthday cupcakes for Pastor Terry. Happy birthday, Terry. Um, but we say, oh, we love those cupcakes, or I love those little sprinkles on there. It makes the cupcake special. Um, but this kind of love, this agape love that God had, and, and I've said it many, many times before, it wasn't the ropes. It wasn't the nails that kept Jesus to the cross. It was love. He stayed on the cross. He went to the cross because of agape love. A love that's given freely and openly with no strings attached. That kind of love that is a sacrificial love is what we want to talk about today. And so in the Greek, uh, and I promised you that I was going to teach you some Greek today. So in the Greek, there's eight different words for love, or eight different forms of love that the Greeks have broken down. And so I'll start with the first one in here. And the first one is eros. And eros in the original Greek, and if you want to hit the slide, um, it'll show you exactly how it's spelled Thank out. You. There we go. And it's this physical kind of love or a sexual desire. So uh, if you ever heard of the term erotic, this is where it comes from, eros. Okay. And it's the type of love that typically involves some kind of passion or lust and or romance. So this is, this is that type of, of love. And so as the Greeks have truly defined it, uh, that is what this one is. The next one that we're going to talk about is philia. And philia in the original Greek is an affectionate love. And that is, that is the kind where you love a friend. You have a, you have a love uh, for one another. And it is that kind of uh, kind of a connection with other people. And so the philia is an affectionate love, and it's the type of love that involves friendship. And it allows you, and I'm not talking about acquaintances here, I'm talking about somebody that you have that's in your life that you truly love. Okay? Um, and it's not a sexual type of love, it's a love because you have embraced that friendship. The next one is a weird word, and it's called storage. Storage. So, uh, storage is a familiar love, and this is brotherly love, if you want to call it that. So this is a love that is a natural love that family members have for one another. And I know, I know, I know, you know, that's kind of a tough one at times. There's times when my brother and I, we were at odds and all kinds of different things. But still, in the end, no matter what, you still love them. No matter how many times they poke you and beat you and tease you, you still love them, right? Yeah, that's storage, okay? The next time is one that we see in society a lot today, and it's called menya. Now, in menya is the way it's pronounced in Greek. Mania is what we say in English. So menya is a, an obsessive love, and menya is the kind of love that a stalker feels towards their victim. And I wanted to use that terminology in here so you understand that it is not a natural type of love. It is not a natural type of love. Okay? So if we talk about kind of an evil spirit coming upon you, that is mania. And that is a type of love, and it's not good. 
it comes it's evil actually and the Greeks knew this as well as we do and this is where the word maniac comes from it derives from this and, and I don't think I need to explain that one a lot more here but it, it is an evil kind of desire that overcomes a person and that's what mania is okay so so far you've learned four Greek words for the day not too bad huh yeah. Okay, the next one that we have is luda. And luda originally isn't from Latin, but the Greeks also use it. And it's kind of, uh, uh, oh, it, it's, it's kind of a game play, which fits with the type of love that it refers to. And it's equip on, equip, uh, equivalent to the word, and I'm not even gonna go there for here, but it's a word for courtship. And Ludus is playful, non-committal love. This is what you would call infatuation, flirting, seduction, casual sex, those kind of things. It originated in Latin. And if you remember from the Greek orgies and things that they had, that was what this is from. Uh, so if you have ever heard the term ludicrous, it t describes the kind of person who does this kind of behavior. It actually talks about a behavior. So we'll leave that one alone too. It's not a good kind of love. It's not a good kind of behavior to get engaged in. The next one is called pragma. And pragma is a practical kind of love. Pragma is based on duty, obligation, or logic. And pragma is an unsexy love that you might find in the political arranged marriages throughout history. Pragmatic is the term that we use for this type of relationship, which means, uh, you know, when they had arranged marriages and things in the past, you had no choice in the person that you were going to be troth to to spend the rest of your life with. And so pragma is that type of relation. See, we, this is still under the guise of love, but it's that kind of relationship that was arranged and it may not have any of the uh, any of the other types of love that we've already discussed in there, and so it's very pragmatic. It means you have an obligation to fulfill, whether you like it or not, and it's pragmatic, which means it's not something that you would normally go into. It is not something that you would do of your own accord, and so we take that as something that is not really truly what we would want for our lives, but it is a need that we have to fulfill, an obligation that we have to fulfill. So that's what pragma is. The next one is felucia. <laughs> and felucia is a self-love. No, not that kind. It is a self-love, and it refers to how a person views themselves and how they feel about their own body and their own mind. So if we want to take it one step further, Egomaniacal narcissists think they're better than everybody else, and they're an example of felucia. Not in a healthy way. I am so in love with myself that I'm the only one who really matters to me and in my life. So, who here has ever watched Sheldon? Right? Right? Okay. You want to talk about the absolute definition of that term. Narcissistic, it's all about me. Mm -hmm. No one else really matters. And if you try and matter, I'm going to make sure it doesn't matter by the time I'm done. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of egomaniacal narcissist. So, any of you that watch the, uh, the Tony Stark movies that we have there with those things, Tony Stark is a narcissist. He loves himself, he loves to hear about himself. Those are the kind of people we're talking about here. So, that is what Falucia means. But the really the good one that we want to talk about today is agape. And agape is often defined as an unconditional, sacrificial love. So I want to stop there for just a moment. Don't read on. Oh, too late. I see you. I see the eyes going back and forth. But it's an unconditional, sacrificial love. What pops into your mind first thing as I read that to you? Unconditional sacrificial love. I'll give you a clue. Mm -hmm. 
We just need to look at the cross once to understand what an unconditional, sacrificial love is all about. We watched last night. We watched the beatings. We watched the abuse. We watched the crucifixion. Unconditional, sacrificial love. Agape love is the kind of love that is felt by a person willing to do anything including sacrificing themselves without expecting anything in return. So when I talk about no strings attached, most of the time you hear, just as we heard last night from our best buddy Judas, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? No agape love there. He was not willing to sacrifice himself but he's willing to sacrifice somebody else, and he did it for 30 silver coins. 30 silver coins. That's where the term blood money comes from. 30 silver coins. So the love that God has for his people is an agape love. It's an agape love. An unconditional, sacrificial love. From the fall all the way through, he could have destroyed everybody in the Garden of Eden. He could have destroyed it all and started all over. But see, he created man, us. Man is a generalized term, not a sexualized term. Man, he created man in his own image. And he said it was good. And man was good as God created him. I want you to understand this, that man was good as God created him to be. In the Garden of Eden, they were created without death, without illness, without anything. They had nothing to want for. He provided everything for them. All they had to do is go and do and fulfill what God had asked them to do. Be fruitful and multiply. Be a guardian over all of his creation. He turned everything over to them. And all they had to do is obey. But they didn't. But God, because of agape love, didn't destroy them, didn't destroy every other living creature in the world. He could have with just one, one spoken word, and it all would have been gone. But because of this love for what he created, us, he had this unconditional, sacrificial love. And he pursued us and pursues us to this day. No matter how many times we turn away from him, he pursues us. He endows us with the Holy Spirit. He gives us gifts and the fruits of the Spirit. He gives us blessings each and every day. Every time we take a breath, it's a blessing from God. So in his, if, you, if we look at his name in Hebrew, it's Yahweh. And it's the breathing, Yahweh. He is the breath of life. That's where that word comes from. He is the breath of life. So when the Bible is talking about the love of God or the love of Jesus, it is this type of love that it's talking about. This agape love, this unconditional sacrificial love that he is, he is willing to give up anything for another. For another. And it is... It is this love that Jesus is talking about when he addressed the Pharisees. Matthew 22 through 36 says, Jesus said to them, You shall love your Lord with God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. And this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments hangs all of the law and the prophets. What kind of world would we be living in today if we had this kind of agape love for each other? For each other. An unconditional, sacrificial love for each other. That we would be willing to give anything up for someone else. Agape love. This is the kind of love that God has. During Tour 4, Dr. Tackett breaks down what love your neighbor means and starting and revisiting what love really means. 
So love your neighbor is having a steadfast sacrificial zeal that seeks the true good of one who lives near. That's what he defines as a neighbor. Let me say that again. Is having a steadfast sacrificial zeal that seeks the true good of one who lives near. And agape love is the crown jewel in God's meta narrative. And we've been hearing about that a lot. Meaning it is the overarching theme of the entire Bible. The entire history of mankind is wrapped up in that meta narrative. That's what a meta narrative is. I know a lot of people, when he starts talking about meta narratives, if you haven't been through seminary, if you haven't gone through these things, they talk a lot about the different meta narratives that go on. So it's natural for him to talk about that because he teaches at seminary, or did. I'm not sure if he's still teaching or not. But a meta narrative is an overarching story that encompasses a greater story, if that makes sense. The big picture is what I like to call it. So agape love is the crown jewel in God's meta narrative, meaning it is that overarching thing of the entire Bible. It is the very nature of God himself. So as we ask those questions from tour zero, tour one, and tour two, tour three, who is this God that would create? Who is this God that would love? Who is this God that he would send his only son? That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life? Who is this God that does this? It is the very nature of God. God is love. So John 3.16 says it all very plainly. We know it very well, but I want you to listen again. And this time I want you to listen with the love of God in mind. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. It's an unconditional, sacrificial Love. This agape love, the love of God, is the kind of love that is felt by a person willing to do anything for another, including sacrificing themselves without expecting anything in return. How do you get it? How does it make sense? This is the kind of love. This is the kind of love that kept Jesus on the cross. Not robes, not nails. Agape love kept him on the cross. So, love God and love your neighbor. It's both too simple and it's too hard. So Dr. Tackett said there's about 80 million committed Christians leaving 240 million others. We got work to do. We have work to do. If we each were there to talk to three or four of our neighbors, loving them with agape love, we could reach them all. We could reach them all. 240 million of them. Think about it. Christian families committed to the shalom, the peace, the perfected peace. Shalom, shalom. Salim. I talked to you about the Aramaic term. Salim. Salem. Peace. Love. A perfected love. So the, the term that they use, and I think you probably saw it, the chosen, was shalom, shalom. The reason they say that is it is a perfected kind of love, the kind of love that says, may God do in your life today fulfill his promise in you. Wow, that's shalom. That should give you peace in your soul. And that's what they're talking about here. The people of God carrying out that royal law, turning the world upside down and then right side up one neighbor at a time. Now we've got some neighbors and boy, I'll tell you what, uh, when I was writing this this week, I was getting convicted by the next door neighbors. We have two of them, ones are over here and the others are over here. And love your neighbor was something I was going, boy, I'm having a hard time loving this guy. I'm having a hard time loving those people over there because of their actions. 
<laughs> and their disregard for the rest of the neighbors in the neighborhood, including us. Uh, so it's both simple, and I want you to understand, I didn't say easy. It's simple, but it's hard. Some people make it hard for you to love them. Some people have a hard time showing love for others. It's simple, but it's hard. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to get, have you get where, where I'm trying to go with all this, but wait, there's more. So Jesus said we are to love our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. And this will take a sacrificial type of love, and it will take an unconditional love on our part. How many times do I say, hey, God's done his part. Now we have to do our part. Guess what? Here it is. Here's where the rubber meets the road. We have to have that sacrificial type of love for God. To love God with, our all, with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind, with all of our strength. Because it's going to take all of our strength to do it. Jesus is telling us that we need to have an agape love for God just like the one he has for us. But wait, there's even more. Are you ready? We are to love our neighbors as ourselves. That one convicted me. Ouch, 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 ouch. So as I was writing this, my neighbor pulled up in front of the house with a radio blaring music I really do not care for. Uh, and boy, you talk about an instant conviction. Because I'm typing away at my computer and it sits right in the front window. I had the door, front door open, that's like 10 feet away. They pulled up right in front of our house, blaring the music through, and I'm sitting there going, oh boy, you know? Yeah, and I'm supposed to love that, that neighbor as well, right? So then the next door neighbor that called our church a cult and uh, lets his dog do the business in our yard. Yep, I'm supposed to love him too. And he's over next door with his diesel truck revving up the engine. And, yeah, uh -huh. An unconditional, sacrificial love. It's not going to be easy, but it will be worth it in the end. It's not going to be easy, but it will be worth it in the end. <laughs> 1 John 3 says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it does not know him. We have work to do. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we will be like him. For we shall see him as he is, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies us just as he is pure. By the grace of God, we are blessed with his love. But moreover, we are blessed with salvation from our sins. We are released, redeemed, redeemed from our sins because of the grace of God. We are blessed with his love. It's not by words. We can't do anything to earn grace. We can't do anything to earn God's love. God's love's been there for us before we were born. So verse 16 continues in 1 John, and it says, We know that what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Dear children, let us not merely say that we love each other, but let us show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth. So we will be confident when we stand before God even if we feel guilty, God is greater than our feelings, and he knows everything. Dear friends, if we don't feel guilty, we can come to God with bold confidence. And we will receive from him whatever we ask because we obey him and do the things that pleases him. What pleases God? To be fruitful 
That's what he's called us to do. How do we do that? By showing agape love to everyone, even the ones that makes it really hard for us to do. And God sent Jesus to us and told us that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one goes to the Father except through him. And God tells us this, and this is God's commandment to us. We must believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another just as he has commanded us. Those who obey God's commandments remain in fellowship with him. And we know that he lives in us because the spirit he gave us lives with us, indwelling with us. The spirit of holiness <laughs> lives within us. We can be holy because of his spirit that he blesses us with. It is the only way we can be holy. The only way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Being and abiding in him is the only way to eternal life. Not by our good works, but by the grace of God's agape love. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, I come before you today just as I am, and I'm sorry for my sins. I repent of my sins today. Please, please forgive me. In your holy name, in your holy name, I forgive all others for what they have done against me. I renounce Satan and the evil spirits and all of their works, and I give you my entire self, unconditionally, sacrificially to you today. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I accept you, Lord Jesus, as my Lord, my Savior. Heal me, change me, strengthen me in body, soul, and spirit. Come, Lord Jesus, cover me with your precious blood and fill me with your Holy Spirit and anoint me and appoint me to be your disciple today. I love you, Lord Jesus. I praise you, Lord Jesus, and I thank you, Lord Jesus. In your precious and holy name, we come before you today, and we submit ourselves to you today. Amen and amen. amen. And in case you don't know what the term amen means, it means so may it be. on the night that Jesus was betrayed he would break bread with the disciples not just one of them not just five of them all twelve including Judas this love Jesus taught love your enemy and in the process of having this meal with his disciples at the very end of his time with them. In the great bread, even with the one who would betray him. That's love. Jesus broke the bread. Giving it to his disciples, he said, this is my body broken for you, too. and he would fill it. And this is the blood of the new covenant. His blood shed for the sins of many. When he says many, he says everyone. Believer or no, not believer. That gives everyone a choice. That's their free will. Father God, we thank you for 
the love that Jesus shows us through this meal. We ask that what he did that night would resonate with each of us. So we would truly understand your love for us, your redemptive love that gives us life eternally with you. Father, let us be your hands and feet here on this earth. When we leave this place today, let people see and hear you through us. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. What, a, what an appropriate sermon this morning. <laughs> Since our, my neighbor and I met in the street <laughs> in our cars this morning, not in a good way, but I love my neighbors, and so we got out and gave each other a hug, and, and just thank God it hasn't happened in 10 years that we've lived there <laughs> together, so, and we move on. So I thank God that uh, we love each other, and, you know, they're good neighbors, and I praise God for them. So today we're doing the prayers for the people. Anybody else need prayer besides me? <laughs> <laughs> pray for the entire world. Yes, yeah. yes, I am. And, yeah. and in your sermon, I have part of your sermon and one of your uh, scriptures in here. God is good. So yes, he is. Um, okay, well, let's go to prayer. We come into your house today to give you glory, honor, and praise, Lord Jesus, to seek your help in times of trouble, to pray over each other and to help us understand your word. As you say in Mark 12, 30, 31, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So I ask Lord that you will resonate these words into the hearts and minds of all people that they might turn back to you and love their neighbors as themselves. Bring love back into the hearts of men, women, and children, and restore their souls. For our fight is against the principalities, the evil forces in the world, and America needs your help, O oh God. We need your help to restore America back to you. Please bring restoration and healing back into this land, and we thank you, Jesus, for all things. Father, today we lift up Diane's mother, Anne, my Aunt Betty, and Steve's brother, Larry, to you for healing. You have walked with them throughout their lives. Please let your Holy Spirit rest in them, giving them peace as you give them strength and courage to walk with you to the end of their days. Give them comfort and love. Please hold on to them forever, dear Jesus. We thank you and praise you, Father God, for their lives. And we thank you for letting us be a part of their lives. <laughs> Father God, I lift up my brother David, who is starting the fight with cancer. I pray you will keep his body and mind strong. Give him confidence to overcome this fight he is in. Bring him closer to you each and every day, Lord Jesus. Father God, I lift up all who are here today and, and who are online, who are um, battling illness, cancer, or physical ailments. You are Yahweh Rapha, the God who heals. I call on your mighty name to bring your healing power into these people's lives. Get them the help they need to recover quickly. In your mighty name, we ask all these things. Father God, I lift up Lynette's dad who fell yesterday and broke his shoulder. I lift up Carla's cousin, Sean, who was in a motorcycle accident. Lord Jesus, please give them the care they need. Guide the doctors and nurses to be able to help them and surgically fix what is needed to bring them back to health quickly. Comfort them as only you can. And we praise your name for their healing. Father God, as always, continue to watch over our children and grandchildren and bring them back to you. We thank you for what you are doing in their lives. Be with our homeless and comfort, each, comfort them each and every day. Bring them shelter and jobs to bring them up and out of their current situations, Lord Jesus. And thank you, Father God, for your word to guide us through this life. Let us remember Psalms 145:13. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, 
and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is faithful to all his promises and loving toward all he has made. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us so unconditionally. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. <clears throat> For those words today, that's always a blessing. Uh, God is really anointed you. God works. <laughs> he does. I, it's amazing because we don't talk about our no. mess, my message, and I, I swear, Terry's three quarters right. of the time she's she's talking about in her prayers what we yeah. talk about in her message. Is that is the orchestration of God. Mm -hmm. That's the Holy Spirit at work mm -hmm. talking to us. So understand that you have been blessed that way. Amen. This is what we're talking about today on Pentecost Sunday. Yeah. Is that blessing of the Lord, that that indwelling within us, mm -hmm. that we should dwell within him and he with us through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's amazing how the Holy Spirit works. Mm -hmm. uh, so this brings us to the end of our online portion of our service today. We thank you for being with us. Make sure you say howdy in the notes and let us know that you were there. Uh, the music today, please uh, please listen to that. Uh, click on the links, listen to what, what we have there today and uh, uh, hopefully that message will speak to you as well and help to carry you throughout your week. So let's go to God in prayer. Oh, wow. That was quite a message you gave me today, Lord. Thank you. We thank you that you've sent that advocate of the Holy Spirit upon us today and that he is indwelling within us. And Lord, we just lift up all of those who are lost, the least in society today. Those who are hurting, those who have lost loved ones. Lord, we know that your grace is sufficient for all, all of your children. And we ask that blessing upon each one of them to be blessed each in their own way. Lord, we lift up those who are having to contend with dangers and difficulties within the world that we live in today. We ask that you would comfort and strengthen each one who is suffering. Draw each one close to you. Let us surround them with your agape love. Show them that unconditional self-sacrifice love that you give to us freely and openly. Let us accept it into our hearts today and show it forth to our neighbors. No matter how hard that is, Lord, embolden us and empower us to do so. Help us to go forth and show your grace and your goodness as a beacon to others so they will want to know more about your agape love. Comfort and surround each hurting heart. Bless those who are in need of healing. Bring relief to those who are in need and keep each one of us firm in the faith as we face the world that we live in. We thank you, Lord. There's not one of your children who is lost to your eyes. And we lift each and every one of those people up to you right today and ask for your blessing to be upon them. Anoint them and love them today. In Jesus' name.